Good morning and welcome to the online gathering of the Town Church. My name is Nate Downey and I am a pastor at the Town Church. I am really glad that you could join us this morning. I want to take a moment and celebrate the birth of the newest member of our Town Church family. Baby Seth Sanborn was born yesterday, Saturday, May 9th. And so we, as a church, we rejoice and we celebrate this gift of God for the Sanborn family and for our church. So, so excited for, for James and Allison and their, their family. As you know, for the past seven weeks, our church family has been separated in order to observe the shelter in place order that our local authorities have put in place. And while our county has entered what's being called stage two of the state and local response to COVID-19, we are still not permitted at this point to, to all gather together as a church family. And so while we grieve, we truly grieve this separation, uh, I wanna encourage you to remember that this is temporary and that, uh, and, that, and that you and I, that we continue to make an effort to remain connected as best we can during this time of separation. And our leadership team is discussing uh, what it will look like for our church to transition back into gathering together, meeting together, what precautions are we gonna take? And we will keep you informed as decisions are made and as our plans are established. Now, as we've gathered together virtually these past couple of months, I have preached seven video sermons. And I'm not gonna pretend that I enjoy preaching to a camera because I, I don't. And I especially don't like watching myself afterwards. <laughs> but, but I am thankful that we've been able to continue to learn and grow together in Jesus. But instead of a sermon this morning, uh, we're going to do something a little different. We are going to practice the public reading of Scripture. Now, we, we know that in the early church, the letters of the Apostle Paul and the other apostles, their writings were routinely read publicly in the gatherings of church communities. And of course, we know in in the time of the New Testament and earlier in Scripture, few people uh, knew how to read. And that meant that unless the Scriptures were read aloud, they would never hear them. Uh, nevertheless, it's important uh, not to underestimate the power that public Scripture reading still has for us as Christian believers today. Reading alongside other people, it guards us against distractions, it provides us with a sense of fellowship and community, and it's a practice that God's people have always done to remind themselves of their identity, who they are, and our commission, what we've been called for, and it's still a powerful practice for us today. So please watch this short video from our friends at the Bible Project, and then we will practice this public reading of Scripture together. I was reading the Bible, which, you know, is kind of hard to do, but I came across this verse that says, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. Yeah, this is in Paul's letter to Timothy, who's a young pastor, and he's telling him about ways that he can keep his church community engaged with Scripture. Okay, so preaching the Bible, I get. Teaching from the Bible, I get that too. But what about this reading Scripture together thing? Is that something I'm supposed to care about? Why did Paul think it was so important? Oh man, for Paul, this was a really significant practice for the people of God. Think all the way back to Mount Sinai, where the Israelites were just rescued from Egypt. They're no longer slaves, and they need a new identity, a new story to live by. And so Moses, he gathers the people together, and he reads the scriptures aloud. He reminds them of where they came from, who they are, and the new future that they're called to live for. This was the first public reading of scripture in the Bible. Yeah, and it didn't stop there. When the people finally got into the land, they did it again. Joshua pulled the people together, and they all listened to the scriptures read aloud so they could remember where they came from and how they could keep living as a part of this new story. So this is something they did all the time then. 
Well, actually, no. After Joshua died, we don't have any more stories of the people coming together to hear God's word. Instead, the people forgot their story, and a whole generation arose that didn't know their God or what God had done for them. But then, centuries later, a king named Josiah rediscovered the scriptures, and he was so excited that he called Israel to begin this practice once again. It sparked a renewal movement. That is, until the people forgot once more, and they ended up in exile. And so this is why, when Ezra and Nehemiah came back from the exile, they needed to remind the people who they are and how they are to live. So this is a powerful practice. Yeah, in fact, reading scripture together became a core part of Jewish life. It was done every week as they gathered in synagogue. Jesus himself participated in this practice. He even launched his mission during the weekly reading of the scriptures. He read from the scroll of Isaiah, and then he told everyone these words were about him. And that brings us all the way back to the early church where Paul told Timothy to keep this practice going to immerse the whole community in the story of the scriptures. Okay. But here's the thing. Most people back then didn't know how to read, so they had to do it publicly. But I can read the Bible by myself. Yeah, and you should totally do that. But don't underestimate the power of this ancient practice. Reading the Bible by yourself can be hard. It can be easy to get distracted. But something happens when you hear God's word read aloud and when you're with other people. And besides, it's really easy. You don't need anyone to preach or teach. You just need to listen to the scriptures and then talk about what you've heard. This is what God's people have always done when they enter into new and uncertain times. They remember their story and who they are through the public reading of the scriptures. I've asked my wife, Dallas, to help me today as we read Paul's letter to the church in the city and region of Philippi, a letter that we call Philippians. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to put away your phone, uh, unless you're watching this on your phone, and, and to really focus as you listen to God's word being read. And it may benefit you to not even follow along in your Bibles, but to simply give your full attention to listening to the scriptures breathed out by the living God being read. So let's begin in Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with the knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes. And I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, 
but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you and that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you, should, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy has proven worth how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may, re you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. 
for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, become like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join me, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him, who strengthens me. 
Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To God and to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is God's word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Town Church, I want to encourage you to continue abiding in Jesus through time in prayer and through time in God's word. And, and I want you to hear again this promise that we read, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And now let's respond together to who Jesus is and what he has done for us through taking communion, through giving, and through singing. We love you, Town Church. We miss you very much. May the peace of Christ be with you.